It was one of many, many things that we trialled with Fast Track teachers. It just happened to be the thing that teachers said was useful and practical and they could take away and use tomorrow in the classroom. Today, in this lesson, we're going to be thinking about this word. Who can read it for me? Responsibility. Responsibility. Who can tell us what that means, responsibility? Chantelle. Like, um, if your friend's in a fight, you're going to try and take responsibility for your actions. Surrey Square School in South London is a fun place to learn. After experiencing this firsthand in the classroom, I met head teacher Liz Robinson to find out what part NLP played in the school's success. So I first came across NLP as, in fact, part of the Fast Track training programme, and that was partly looking at how you can develop yourself as an individual, how you can learn to manage your state when it's very stressful and all those different things, but also looking at NLP to support a range of different teaching techniques. Which NLP techniques do you think are useful for teachers? I think it's not just about techniques in NLP, it's about approaches more generally. So one of the most important things that I've taken from NLP and worked with the teachers on is about their use of language. Um, so there's certain key words that hold in them a whole load of presuppositions. So a good example is but. If I say to you, that was a really good piece of work, but next time you need to do this, you know, our brain finds it very difficult to process the compliment that was the first part because the but has negated it. If I say the same sentence to you with the word and instead, you process that in an entirely different way. So that was a really nice piece of writing. And next time, I'd like you to do this. So that's a very simple example and is a way that we've worked with the staff to find ways to make our feedback and our comments to children um, have the intention that we mean <laughs> and not that our language lets us down. You had an outstanding Ofsted report. And in the report, it um, said that core values are modelled from the top and shared by everyone. Is that an example of NLP working in practice? Absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't give all the credit to NLP because the point is it was myself and the staff who've done those things. But undoubtedly, NLP enhanced what we were already doing and gave us, I suppose, the confidence and some additional techniques and skills to really see through our vision of making this an outstanding learning community. This month, uh, the first large-scale randomised control trial investigating NLP in the classroom has begun in Sussex. And essentially, the learners will be tested in a single-level maths test at the beginning of the research and the end of the research. There will be teachers who have been trained in NLP language patterns and teachers who haven't. And there will be proper control groups as well so that we can unpack some of the things that are going on. And of course, as with any experimental design, we don't really know what the outcome will be. To me, that sounded like the kind of research governments and funding bodies might take seriously. But it didn't sound like the kind of research that Richard Bandler would like. I was right. They're trying to test it the way any good social psychologist would. So how would you test it? By cutting everything. Well, I would test it uh, totally differently. I'd build a new school from the ground up. That's how I would test it. And, you know, and I would take uh, lots, of, lots of the kids that are doing badly in school and lots of the kids that are doing good in school, and I'd mix them all up together in a new formula. And I'd get rid of the grade level notion and I'd make a race to the end of the educational system. Find out how fast, how many of these kids could hit the cross line. I don't know how well that would go down with the Department for Education. Yet there's something about Bandler, his charisma, his passion and his wild ideas that clearly affects people deeply. Could it be the strength of his personality rather than the techniques he helped develop that have made him an NLP so successful? Professor David Pilgrim. We do know after 30 or 40 years of research into the relationship between process and outcome in psychological therapy that the best predictor of outcome is the quality of the working relationship. That's more important than the model adopted by a therapist. So that bit of evidence is really quite important. And the reason it's important for NLP and other models which are very much based upon techniques or bags of tricks is that it tends to displace the emphasis on the working relationship. But the caution is that models do matter and the reason for that is that we also know that adherence to a model provides consistency, reliability and trustworthiness in the relationship. So what's sometimes called treatment fidelity or program fidelity is important but it's actually important because it builds up a good relationship. It's not a person in LP, it's, it's an activity. There's quite a lot of research saying that it's actually the relationship that's actually more important than any techniques 
you. Yeah, and prostitutes you, say the same thing. But, but you come across as a very charismatic man, and so maybe you're so successful because you're an exceptional therapist. Boy, that's really desperate. That's so desperate. That's <laughs> really desperate. Excuse me, you go, oh, well, it's just your personality. It's not the technology that you've been teaching to people for four decades. Well, it, then it must be that all the people that are doing well with it, it must just be their personality. But personalities do count in NLP. The guru-like status of Bandler and NLP's co-founder, John Grinder, has led to intense rivalry between the different societies and associations running NLP courses. It seems like who you're trained by is more important than the research base, and the fight over legitimacy goes straight to the top. There are people doing NLP who are exquisite, and they come every year and they get more training. We call them licensed trainers and licensed master practitioners. Who are they licensed by? They're licensed by, by the society, which is it's something that I set up many years ago. Now, there are lots of people that say they're an NLP practitioner, or they have a, cert a certificate in their office that says NLP practitioner. But if it doesn't say licensed practitioner, then all they really need to qualify for that is a printer. Michael Carroll works closely with John Grinder the other founder of NLP. NLP was created by two people. So, you know, John Grinder certifies trainers through the International Trainers Academy. Those trainers can issue certificates to their participants through the International Trainers Academy, signed in ink by John Grinder, just as the same way as the Society of NLP certificates are signed in ink by Richard Bandler. So to be properly trained in NLP, you've got to attend a good course. I tell you, the course is a little bit more authentic if it is by one of the co-creators of NLP because you're actually connecting with one of the people who co-created it or it's ran by somebody who has been endorsed or certified by one of the co-creators of NLP. Yet there's something more to Bandler than ownership of NLP training. A strong anti-establishment message runs through his ideas. If nothing else... He and John Grinder have freed a group of psychological techniques from the medical profession and allowed everyone access to them in books and seminars. I'm not in the business of deciding how your government spends money. That's not my job. My job is to create new techniques that do things and to test them to make sure that they work and teach them to the people who want to learn them. No one is required to learn anything I teach and nobody is required to go to anybody who teaches anything I teach. There is no obligation. The government can't force you to go to a neurolinguistic programmer and have him work with you. That's why I won't let governments have my intellectual property rights, because I don't want this enforced or done by governments. Libertarian ideas aside, Banner said he created NLP scientifically. But is the guru in him stronger than the scientist? You say that you're interested in what works, so what's the problem with researchers, scientists trying to find out what works in NLP? I have no problem with it. I just don't like the fact that they're trying to measure what works and they're going about it in an idiotic way. You know, here, four decades and no one has ever asked me when they do research about my work. Doesn't that strike you as a little odd? The more you look at how they construct these research projects, they're not researching what they think they're researching. As a mathematician, we use modeling to do that. We study behavior, we build a calculus that represents it, and then compute what other things would be there. That's how we extend the range of what we know. And uh, social scientists don't use that model. If Richard Bandler continues to reject the social science model, it's hard to see how his brand of NLP can be reconciled with mainstream psychology. It will still be available for self-help in the home, but the scientific world is increasingly trying to put NLP on a surer footing whether Bandler likes it or not. With leaders in psychology and education increasingly putting NLP to the test through the scientific method, it won't be long before we know how effective it really is. Will it disappear completely or become an evidence-based therapy to rival CBT? With that kind of knowledge, NLP could look very different in the years ahead. The Power to Persuade, the story of NLP, was presented by William Little and produced by Cathy Edwards.